Okay, so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone for coming to the uh, open day on uncertainty in artificial intelligence theory in large-scale applications. We had a great example over the last week of planning under uncertainty because we didn't really know what was going to happen with the snow. And so we ran our models on it and we decided we're going to defer deciding until uh, the lunch. We're certainly going to go as planned until lunch since the lunch is already ordered. And we'll have the poster sessions. And about the afternoon sessions, we'll decide uh, as late as possible since our algorithm determined this is the optimal strategy. You guys are already here, so what's the point in deciding? Um, I'd like to start really by thanking our sponsors who made this, uh, uh, this day possible. Uh, we have funding for the National, from the Israeli Science Foundation as part of our uh, Center of Excellence in Graphical Models. Uh, this is a center of excellence that includes five researchers at the Hebrew University, uh, the three afternoon speakers, Neil Friedman, Tali Tishbi, and myself, and Amir Globerzen and Galilee Dan, who are in, in Google at the time, right now, but are part of the center. Uh, I'd also like to thank our, the Ministry of Science and Technology, who fund this open day as part of the uh, Center also for Excellence, or Center for Knowledge in Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. Uh, and the Intel Collaborative Research Institute on Com Computational Intelligence, which are also very generously uh, funding this day. And I, since uh, I'm giving the, I'm here in two different hats, uh, I'm a member of these centers and I'm supposed to speak in the afternoon. Uh, but another, uh, pers uh, another uh, sponsor of this day is the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and I'm also the head of the School of Computer Science and Engineering. So I'll t I want to just use this opportunity to say a few words about the uh, school. Uh, so uh, we are all a third. Uh, another sponsor of this day is the uh, Rachel and Salim Benin School of Computer Science and Engineering. And so I just wanted to take the opportunity, since we have some people here who are not from the school, just to tell you about what the school is, where it's going, uh, and what you should tell your friends about the school. Uh, so we have 47 and 3 quarters faculty members. Uh, it's only at the Hebrew University that you can have fractional. That are uh, uh, situated across three buildings, the beautiful Rothberg buildings that you're inside. Uh, which have the computer science and computer engineering faculty, which are about 39 faculty members. We have another uh, eight or nine faculty members who do applied physics, who sit in the Bergman building. And we have two half appointments in the bioengineering program, which sit in the Silverman building. We have over 1,400 students, of which uh, 1,100 are undergrads, uh, 200 our master's students and about 100 do a PhD. I'll talk more about how they, uh, what the programs are that we offer. I think one take home message that I hope you all take home is that we have incredible growth both in our students and our faculty members. Uh, so this graph over here is just the number of students in our school as a function of time, as a function of year. So we had about 1,000 in 2000, we're at about 1,500 now and we'll plan all our Models predict that we will continue to grow uh, at approximately this rate in the next two or three years. So I wouldn't be surprised if you make 1,700 undergrad students in two years. These are the number of faculty members we, uh, in, this, in the school that goes from 35 to around 50. And again, all our models indicate that we'll continue to grow. We have support from the university to grow by a, something like an, an additional 20 faculty members in the next five years. So if you either have friends who want to study here or have friends who want to apply for a job here, yes, this is the time. We have the positions and we're growing. Just a few words about our educational vision, what makes us different from the other computer science and engineering programs around Israel and maybe around the world. So I think one major thing is unlike all other uh, universities in Israel, we're interested in bridging the, gra the gap between science and engineering. If you go to Technion, if you go to Tel Aviv, obviously if you go to Weizmann, <laughs> you won't see uh, computer science and computer en and electrical engineering in the same uh, building. Specifically in Weizmann, you won't even find them on campus. 
And so a major vision that we have is that we have the computer science and the electrical engineers as part of the same group. And in our teaching, this is because we, we offer a three-year program in computer science, which currently has 770 students. But we also have a four-year program in electrical and computer engineering, which currently has 200 students, and another four-year program in electrical and computer engineering with a specialization in opto and microelectronics, which currently has 100 students. So again, if you have fam family members who are thinking of where to study, a lot of people don't know that there's an option to study electrical engineering here, but there is. We have excellent students and excellent faculty members. Uh, the other part of our vision, which is very unique, is that we want to combine computer science with other disciplines. We have a fantastic program that hope you'll hear an example of maybe in the afternoon from Nia Friedman's research that combines computer science and life sciences. Uh, we have a very unique program that combines computer science together with the B'Tselel Academy of Art. So students there study a full undergraduate program uh, in the arts as well as in computer science. And we're just opening a new one on computer si society and networks, which will combine studies in computer science and the social sciences. Yes, we have the brain, that's true. Uh, our research vision, again, I think is unique and it's connected to this idea of our undergraduate program is that we really think that computers are not just, co computer science and computation are not just for computers, uh, but we'd like to solve technological problems using computation. So computation is no longer confined to de desktop or mainframe computers, but computation is everywhere, whether it's cars that drive themselves or it's uh, medicine, personalized medicine. Computation, I think, is at the forefront of solving technology, technology in the 21st century. And that means that if we think of the theory that we need to develop here in the university, it's far and above the standard computer science theory. Although Google might not like to think of it, its self-driving car has to obey the laws of physics. And so uh, we are, our students, we want them to study physics, to study biology, to get to be exposed to much more than just mathematics and computer science. And also a lot of things that are not part of the traditional computer science um, curriculum and are in research, we want them to be in this building, whether it's signal processing, control theory, information theory, game theory, statistics, and of course data science. So I think this, uh, now I'll take off my hat as a head of the school and go back to the, I, don't th I think this, the open day today is really a prime example of the kind of research uh, that we think should, is, is part of the, of the vision of our school, uncertainty and artificial intelligence. Uh, really, if we want to solve technological problems using computation, we'll, we need strong theory and we need to reckon with uncertainty. And I think the talks, the exciting lineup of talks that we have for the rest of the day will help us see what is the um, forefront of research these days worldwide in this area. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Are we already at 10 o'clock? So I'm, uh, we can start. Yeah. Yes, okay. So our first speaker is uh, Professor Max Welling from the University of Amsterdam. I think Max embodies a lot of what I talked about because he was trained as a physicist, uh, did his first postdoc at Caltech in artificial intelligence and computer vision, and did a second postdoc with a name that will crop up a lot uh, during today's lectures with Jeff Hinton. Uh, so he did a postdoc with Jeff Hinton, then he moved to UC Irvine, where he was an associate professor before moving to the University of Amsterdam just last year. Is that right? And his talk is entitled The Return of the Helmholtz Machine. So please join me in welcoming Max Welling. All right, now that I'm all wired up, um, let me start by uh, thanking the organizers, uh, Yair and Naftali and Nir for this, inviting me to this wonderful workshop and also Ronit for extremely good uh, organization. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about uh, Helmholtz machines actually um, and there's, there's two topics as you will see in a minute. Um, this is joint work with my amazing two students, uh, Dirk Kingma and uh, Taco Cohen. And as usual, most of the work that you will see, you know, is being executed by, by these two students. And lots of the credit goes to them. Um, so here's the sort of the plan of today. There's two 
seemingly different topics that I'm going to talk about, but they're uh, connected. Um, and the first one is basically the, ret the return of the Helmholtz machine, or the revenge of the Helmholtz machines. And um, the second topic is basically the elementary particles or parts of data. Uh, this is around group theory. And then if time allows, um, I can still talk a little bit about uh, machine learning in the browser, which is a sort of a slightly lighter topic at the end. Okay, so um, in the literature of machine learning, um, when we, in the times we were doing graphical models mostly, um, <clears throat> there were three types of models that we were typically studying, and they all had their arrows pointing in different directions. Um, so there are sort of Bayesian network models, which, or otherwise called sort of, uh, uh, no, let's say Bayesian network models, um, and in the deep learning literature that we call the deep belief networks, where you have some latent factors at the top where you're sort of independently generating from, and then it sort of goes through a number of sort of stochastic transformations until you sort of generate your data here at the bottom. So it's called a generative model because you can actually generate data from that model. Um, you can sort of remove the, uh, the, the arrows in which case it becomes like a, a, a mark of random field um, or in the deep literature it's called these days a deep Boltzmann machine where you have multiple layers basically of associations between these layers. O again this is a generative model because you can generate data from it in this case it's a whole lot more complicated because you have to run a Gibbs sampler over this entire sort of structure in order to generate your data sort of at the bottom here. And then there's another class of models, um, which I will call discriminative models, um, where you're basically interested in a mapping from, from some input, let's say an image, uh, to an output, which is a target label. You want to figure out whether there's a face in an image or whether there's a car in an image. Um, and this sort of, the arrows point the other direction. You give the, you know, the, the input data and you transform it multiple times and then at the end is your target. Um, and sort of this in the deep, liter deep uh, learning literature is, is typically something like a deep neural net or a convolutional network. And of course you can put some probability distribution at the end, but it's a conditional model of sort of target given input. And um, it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, what are the advantages or disadva and disadvantages of generative versus discriminative models? So as generative models, the reason I like generative models so much is that you can actually model something, right? It's, uh, you know, you can imagine the generative process of how data is generated. For instance, you could have a very sophisticated model of a vocal tract in order to try to understand how speech is synthesized. Um, and so you can actually inject your expert knowledge into your model, which is a very powerful thing to do. And then you can simulate data uh, from your model to sort of look at you know, how good your model is or what your, what your model is thinking. And you have probabilities all over the place, right? You have them in, on every variable target or input. You have probabilities and sometimes probabilities are really useful for planning or reinforcement learning. As disadvantages, I see that if you want to do classification and you have this conditional model that for every label you have a model to generate um, sort of data, um, then in order to do your classification, you have to invert that model using Bayes' rule. So you have a model for x given y, and you need to come up with a model for y given x, and you have to invert that. And Bayes' rule is often expensive, um, and as we, you know, and I will generate, and I will argue that actually um, it might also be inaccurate. <coughs> Um, and in particular, this happens if you have a lot of data. If you have a lot of data, then imposing sort of your biases on the problem, um, you know, might not be a good idea if you're just interested in classification. And the reason is that the world is always more complex than you can imagine. It's very, you know, it's not very often that you have exactly the right models. If you have a lot of data, there's details um, that you will not capture by your generative, you know, imagination. 
Um, and so it might, when n is large, actually you might impose too much of your expert bias, and which means that your classifier is limited. So for discriminative models, you know these are these can be very flexible mappings from in you know from input to target. You know the latest models may you know boost 10 billion parameters like these deep neural networks, enormously no, an enormous capacity. Um, and since uh, and they can be trained very efficiently these days by running basically stochastic gradient descent on GPUs. Um, and so if you're just interested in classification. Um, and you don't care much about some of these things up here, then these models are working better right now than the generative models in, in the large data limit. Um, as disadvantages, uh, you know, I, I, I see it's just hard to inject expert knowledge in these models, and, al and also they are very hard to interpret. It's just a black box, you stick something in, something happens and something comes out. And since you're not sort of modeling the generative process, you cannot go back in and say, okay, what happened to this particular variable that I actually have an interpretation for? And so, um, <clears throat> but there may be a way, and there was a way um, in 95, where there were basically both of these models were present in one single um, model or one single sort of learning machine. And it was called the, uh, the Helmholtz machine by, by these authors. And the idea is really that um, you know you have a generative model on one side, you know generating latent variables and then going to X. Um, but then in these models, it's typically very hard to compute. You, you need for the learning update, you need the posterior probability of Z given X, it's sort of something like this. You need to figure out what the distribution over the latent variables is given your input, and that's a very complicated. Um, typically a very complicated procedure. And you have to run uh, sort of MCMC, which is very slow and very, no and very noisy, a high variance, or you have to run variational algorithms, which have a strong bias typically. And so it was very hard to learn these models. Um, and what people, did, you know, what these authors did is they sort of came up with a sort of a model that worked, you know, went the other way around, which started at, at the data X, and it was trained sort of separately to predict or approximate that posterior distribution over the latent variables given the inputs. And so these two then sort of uh, danced together in order to do the learn, sort of to come up with the learning update. So we had uh, basically some model for Q, QZ given X and, and we could sample from that model and using those samples we can then train, you know, compute a gradient for the log probability. And then in this is called the wake phase. And in the sleep phase, we would sort of dream from the model, generate lots of samples, and then train up the recognition model. But the problem is that there's actually two objectives that are sort of trained separately, and there's not a single objective that's going up. And in fact, you know, this, this model had problems. You know, the, the algorithm had problems to train. Um, okay, so I'm still very interested in Helmholtz machines. Um, and the, the reason is you can sort of view it, you know, look at them from two directions. The one direction you can look at them is say, well, from a generative view, right, um, the recognition model is helping us approximate the posterior, and so we can learn more efficiently. And from a discriminative view, you could be interested actually in this mapping. If Z is a target, a label, then this could be your classifier, and you can use your generative model so to, to uh, regularize that disc disc discriminator. Um, and uh, of course it's then very important that P of X given Z is very flexible. And there's two interesting data sort of uh, limits. One is what I call the big data limit, where you have lots and lots of data relative to the number of input dimensions that you have, which is what the Googles and the Yahoos typically use these models for. Um, and um, in that case you can make um, you know, P, P of Z given X has many, many parameters, and you know, you will have to make this generative model really, really complex in order not to limit the model. Um, and uh, you need to be able to train these models very efficiently. And we will see that both of these things can be done with the Helmholtz machine that I will propose. And there's the opposite case, which I think is very interested for the life sciences, which is when D is much larger, larger than N. Um, if you think about, you know, like an MRI scan, it has a couple of million voxels, um, or, you know, fairly soon we will have 
uh, sort of our, all our uh, genome sequenced. Um, you can carry it around on a credit card, so that's billions perhaps even of inputs. And the number of patients hopefully isn't growing all that fast, right? I mean, it's, it's the number of dimensions per patient that's growing fast. And so, in this case, it's actually very interesting to, um, to use P of X given Z as a, as a regularized, as an as a informed regularizer for the classification model. Um, so typically now people use dropout, but dropout is a really blunt knife. It's just saying, well, let's kill half of the model half of the time um, and then sort of, sort of hope that sort of it doesn't overfit. But if you can have a way to regularize these models by injecting your prior knowledge, your expert knowledge, that seems to be a much more powerful way to regularize. Um, and the other thing I will show you is actually that the model we propose very nicely supports unlabeled data. So in other words, a form of semi-supervised learning that, is, that could be very useful here because we could pool all information from all patients together on the one big pool and then train a specified classifier for a particular task. Okay, so um, the Helmholtz machine that we propose is uh, sort of a new version of, you know, a, a new a variation of the old theme. And uh, we will use the variational Bayesian framework in this case, but we will use it in a slightly twisted way. Um, and um, so the variational Bayesian framework basically says uh, you minimize the KL divergence between your model, so this is your generative model, uh, jointly over X and Z, X is observed, Z is latent. And with this part, which is, this is the data distribution, the empirical distribution, and then a variational model that maps from X to the latent variables. Um, and in order to learn, you know, both Q and P here, um, we can, the P step is sort of standard, you know, EM type algorithm um, update, where you just sample your Zs and then you just do your P update. But the Q actually, you can just look at this and just take the gradient and see what happens, right? And uh, you know, you can do that and then you get this expression. Um, and you just wonder why people never used that expression before and I have an, uh, sort of an explanation for that. Uh, but first of all, of course, you cannot compute it. When this Q is sort of a computed expression itself, you know, this is not an expectation that you compute. A typical variational Bayes assumes a Q distribution that's highly tractable, so you can do integrals you know, analytically. But we will step away from that. Um, so this is uh, what we need to approximate. So the first thing is that um, we actually, there's a sum over data points in here, hidden somewhere. And um, if you want to have a scalable algorithm, um, you do not want every update to depend on every data point. So you know, think of a limit where there's an infinite number of data you do not want to have an algorithm that depends on an infinite number of data for an update. So you have, you, you need to be able to subsample your data in order to become scalable. And um, there is a, sort of this nice work by um, these authors where they applied uh, sort of mini batch sampling or mini batch updates to variational, al um, to variational algorithms. And we sort of be building on this. It's called stochastic variational base. It's not very difficult You just subs subsample you know, some of the data and stick it in here and it becomes a stochastic update. And the other thing is where we deviate from ordinary vari variational Bayes is that instead of having a tractable distribution Q, uh, Z here, we will actually come up with a distribution that it, the only requirement is that it's very efficient to sample from. So in other words, um, this could be a neural network type of discriminative network that starts from the input, one pass <coughs> up through the network and then generate Z's independently and efficiently, right? And um, so now we have two sources of, of variation. You know, if we stick those samples in here, one is from, you know, subsampling the data and one is from sampling from Z. And now this update, update gets very, very noisy. And I'm sure people have tried to run this update um, and for that reason, it just doesn't work because your gradient is just uh, uh, completely uh, noised up and you know you cannot learn anything. So actually sort of recently people have started to sort of realize this, um, various groups, and sort of the, uh, the, the you know the approach that we took in order to solve this is, is very very trivial but uh, you know but it, but it solves it. Um, so basically you move from the typical Bayesian network view of things which is you know a, a probability distribution of Z given its parents um, you move to a slightly different one, which is to say, 
Well, let me just um, sample epsilon from some standard distribution, let's say a normal distribution with zero mean and, and, and unit variance, and then think of the transition here as a deterministic function of its parents and this epsilon that I've been generating. So this is just a function, and that's actually a stochastic process. In statistics, they call this the centered form and the non-centered form. And the, ma the main point is that this distribution doesn't depend on the parameters anymore, and you can just take gradients very easily. And so then the gradient of the, um, uh, of the log likelihood it looks like this, and it, you know, where, z, where z is being sampled from, from abs, you know, uh, z is a function of epsilon being sampled from p of epsilon, and then it is like this. And it actually solves this variance problem. The variance is much lower for this particular estimator, and other people have come up with other ways to reduce the variance. But once people started to understand that the variance was the problem, people could come up with, with new solutions for it. And now the whole sort of framework works, it's very nice. So now we can actually build, you know, very complicated uh, generative models, which are basically Bayesian networks, um, but in this sort of new uh, non-centered view, where you know you, you generate something stochastically at the top, then you go through a number of uh, deterministic transitions, like a neural network, and at the end, sort of you generate uh, you know x given z. And then there's this <coughs> recognition network that goes up. You start with an input data point, and you go through a number of neural network transitions, and you predict a mean and a variance, and then you generate z from that normal distribution with that mean and that variance. Right? And then you can stick these two into your objective, compute gradients, and just maximize a single objective function. Okay, so if you do that and you train it on faces, so here's sort of what you get. Um, what we do here is we sample through Z phase. So this is like a plane that's flying through Z space, which is the latent factors. And at every Z, it generates a face because that's the generative model and we can do that. And uh, what you see is as you fly through Z space, you know, you change from, uh, you know, from uh, between races, you change between genders, from uh, sort of orientation, uh, from smiling to uh, sort of uh, sad. Um, and, the, and the nice, so it basically means that the Z variable, these latent variables really capture the sort of independent um, directions of variation or independent factors of variation that we think are important in these images. And as I said, um, this could be very nicely generalized to semi-supervised learning. And especially in the life sciences, I think this is very nice because we could use our generative models very much here um, because we have, we have good generative models, but also we have little data compared to input dimensions. Um, and in, in addition, we can actually add you know, lots and lots of you know, unlabeled data to the, to the pool. And in that case, the generative model is as before. You know, we have sort of semi super, sometimes observed labels Y, never observed latent factor Z. They're independently generated to produce X. And then from X, you know, we, we have two channels, one going up to predict the label Y. And uh, now this is actually, this could be your classifier here, Y given X, because this is a target. And then from Y, you then inject sort of information from both X and Y into this channel, which is again a neural networky type of, you know, of architecture, to produce your distribution Z given X, Y, and this one, you know, they go back into here and then you sort of run your, your, your learning algorithm. So there's one little sort of hack that you have to do to make this work, I'll admit, which is that um, you're really interested in this channel in the end. So if you're interested in the classifier and you sort of use this Sort of more as a, as, a, as a regularizer for sort of this sort of classifier, then you want to update the importance of that a little bit in your gradients. And so we sort of hack in um, sort of a, a, a variable which says, you know, when you do your updates, give more importance to actually training that. And that improves performance um, a little bit. And then you can sort of play around. So actually, Dirk implemented sort of a very nice environment where you can sort of, you know, stick in some, disc, you know, some, uh, some stochastic nodes, you can stick in some deterministic nodes, right? And you can sort of almost graphically build your model. Um, 
And uh, sort of here's another version where you sort of go up, you generate something stochastically here. So these are deterministic transitions. Then there's a stochastic node here, and then you go through your sort of two-channel thing. And the uh, same thing here. And actually that improves, it turns out. So here's some results. Um, I don't want to overclaim, um, but it, for the model that we compared to, it worked very well. Um, you know, we compared on MNIST, of course. We always have to compa compare on MNIST. And then there's a bunch of other data sets that we compare to SVHN and NORB. Um, and the, mo the method particularly shines in a semi-supervised limit. So this is our method here. These are these other ones. So uh, this is a transductive support vector machine. This is an ordinary neural net and a <coughs> convolutional neural, neural net. Um, they're not necessarily semi-supervised. Uh, manifold tangent um, embedding model, um, contractive autoencoder, and this is our model. So, th so this model is quite similar to our method in, in, in certain ways. And you see that especially in the limit when the number of labels is small, um, this method shines because it can use this generative model as a, as a regularizer. And um, so here what I show is basically, uh, again, flying through z-space. And for every value of the latent factor, I'll just plot uh, but by the way, these movies were made by Dirk uh, King, not by me, of course. And I'll plot for every label Y, I'll plot the digit uh, Y, right? So the class label Y is being plotted here, um, and then Z is this, this the writing style, right? And so you see, for every class label, it will sort of follow a particular writing style. Right? Sometimes it gets thick, it gets slanted. So again, the factors Z sort of change sort of within the class and the factors um, and y is of course just the class itself. And then you can do the same, you know, this is another data set which is a bit harder. These are sort of, uh, uh, no, uh, sort of uh, photos of, of, of digits and again sort of it, 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 it is able to generate from z sort of the, the style and um, and y is the digit. So there's any parameter here that essentially controls your, your variation? And Z, right? So it's, it's the latent factors. So so there's the latent factors at the top that are that are sort of uh, that you're flying through that z space, right? And for every value of z, you then generate an image for every value of y. So y is the is the so the class label, and z is the, the latent factor. So how do you generate so uh, it's being learned, um, but also in this case, um, I think he, you know it's like a smooth sort of trajectory in that space. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's sort of uh, for the first half um, of the talk, um, but it's very but it's very interesting to see that these hidden variables z. Um, they uh, represent the independent factors of variation. Of course, this is a very old story going back, you know, to a distributed representation and so, and so on. But Z are sort of the, uh, or even like factor analysis, right? So they, they represent the independent factors of variation in this model, where Y represents sort of the object class. And so Y changes the class and Z changes within a class, right? So if you keep Y fixed, your object class, and you change y, it's like the way you write the digit, and, um, but it doesn't change the actual digit. Um, and so we can think of z as a symmetry transformation, as a transformation that will keep the class invariant, um, but will change the, you know, the way it's sort of perceived or written. And symmetry transformations, um, I think, are very interesting. Um, they underlie a lot of you know, the great theories of physics that we have. Um, you know, in clearly in the standard model, the elementary particles are all organized by these symmetry groups. They're all representations of these symmetry groups. Um, and even in sort of uh, general relativity or uh, sort of special relativity, uh, observations are related through Lorentz transformations. It's basically, you know, how fast do you fly, th you know, pass by something uh, if you observe something. So it's the same thing you observe, or the same physics you describe, but just observed in a different way. And in physics, they basically require that the physics doesn't change under these symmetry transformations. 
Um, and in general relativity, it's even stronger. It's basically saying that the physics should be invariant under general coordinate transformations, uh, basically connecting acceleration with gravity. It's very, you know, and it's, very, it's a very strong um, sort of principle to follow. And so the question that we asked ourselves, well, we actually have symmetries here too, right? We have symmetries of, of objects that we can transform, and maybe this group theory is a good way to study that as well. Um, and in our case, the, the question basically comes down to, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at things around me um, which are highly entangled. So if I have an image, if I look at the particular, uh, you know, the, the, the values, the color values on each pixels, you know, it's a very strange representation because if I rotate something, then all of these pixel values were, will change uh, in very intricate and complicated and uh, dependent ways. Yet we don't have any problem with this, right? Because if I turn my head, I still interpret the world in exactly the same way. And so we may have sort of some of these invariances built in. And so where the input distribution is by like a big spaghetti of things that is all, all sort of run together and knotted up, you know, what we really want is sort of we want this clean image where everything gets disentangled. Uh, we find these independent factors of variation, uh, but actually I will argue in the next slide that um, you can go a little bit further is that symmetries might also mean that um, symmetry transformations act linearly on this space and that non-symmetries are orthogonal to this. Okay, so this is um, sort of repeating what I just said a little bit. Um, so we really like a picture that is sort of like this where we have objects in the world um, and every object is represented by sort of a plane and um, when, we when we transform an object into itself through a symmetry transformation, we really like that to be a linear transformation, something very simple. Um, and when we move from an o one object to another, you know, this could be a much more complicated transformation that's orthogonal to that plane. And the reason why we really like this is because if we run our classifiers to, to, to sort of classify or discriminate between object A and B, we just have to put sort of this linear classifier and it would work really well, right? So some com something complicated will become linear in this space. It's very similar to kernel methods which try to, uh, to do this too, but in a different way. Um, and so uh, the path that we were on is we say, okay, so we want, we really want sort of to split the, the information into these two streams, which is also well known in computer vision. We want uh, invariant and equivariant transformation. That is transformation that doesn't change the object in symmetries, that sort of change the, one, the object into itself. And both are interesting. One is interesting for object recognition, and the other one is more interested in interesting for sort of motion understanding. And we sort of say, well, there is a very neat mathematical theory to study this is called group theory, and we'll do that. And the other thing which group theory doesn't sort of supply is sort of a probability theory. So we've learned a hard lesson in AI, and this is also the topic of this sort of uh, workshop. The hard lesson is that we should really not forget about uncertainty because our algorithms will become very non-robust. Um, and so what we really need is to combine group theory with probability theory. And this is exactly sort of what I will do in this talk. Uh, so this is work with uh, Taco. Um, and Taco, again, was uh, sort of um, done most of the work for this. So um, again, I'm going back sort of what does it mean uh, to be entangled? So I have an, an image of a four and I rotate it over, th over 90 degrees and I look at this image and for us, you know, I can still recognize this as a four, uh, but for, in terms of the pixel value, this completely changed, right? I mean, some black ones became white and other one, uh, white ones became black and it's very unclear how to sort of do this um, if you don't understand uh, sort of uh, how to transform it into pixel space. And so the pixels are not the independent, are not sort of the disentangled representation because every when you transform every pixel value is a complicated function of every other one. But it turns out there is a representation um, where this sort of the, the, the elements in that representation rotate into each other and have nothing to do with the elements of the other part of the space. And that's called an irreducible representation. So if you look at a rotation or any transformation by a single sort of a conjugation with some matrix W and the matrix for two dimensional rotations 
you know, look very nice. They look sort of these, like these circular Fourier sort of patches. And then on the diagonal, we have um, some matrices, and I'll say something about it. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just do that now. So in a little bit more detail, so there's now sort of coming a few more equations for those. Uh, I hope you can follow this, but you can ask questions. Um, so if this is my matrix of transformations, um, then the irreducible representations sort of look like this. They're sort of subspaces. So uh, there's all zeros out here, and then there's just numbers here. And there's blocks of transformations that take a subspace. Like so this could be a one-dimensional subspace, and this could be a three-dimensional subspace, and a five-dimensional subspace. And instead of, you know, when I <coughs> apply this matrix, clearly it only maps elements of that space into itself. Um, and any sort of transformation that's compact um, can be represented by, let's say, angles, um, and it's, it's differentiable to so sort of a lead group, um, can actually be brought onto this uh, sort of generalized, diagonalized form. And if you identify these, what's called irreducible transformations, so it's irreducible because they cannot be made any smaller. This is the smallest subset of things that can turn into each other. Um, then if I say representation, it really means this. So if I take my matrix element for the elf block, and M and N are the, are the elements of my matrix running here and here, um, for let's say one rotation over an angle G, and then I multiply in matrix notation, I multiply you know, the same you know, T for that level L block, um, but for another rotation over an angle H, now what I should get out is the, represent the, 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 the matrix T, but then for the sum of those two angles. So that's basically, they represent a group. And then the other thing is that very nice is that this T's actually are orth orthonormal. So this looks quite demanding if you look at it, but it's not too bad if you are sort of familiar with the ordi ordinary Fourier analysis, right? If in Fourier analysis, one of these blocks is just one number. It's a complex number, e to the ILG. It's just a phase. Um, and we all know that, you know, um, with these you can do Fourier transformations. I'll show in a minute. And they are orthogonal. So basically if you, in this case, just integrate over an angle G and um, you, you stick in these, these elements here, they are orthogonal. So any two um, will only give you some value if the, um, you know, the L are the same. <coughs> so in other words, they are an orthogonal, orthonormal set of basis functions. And for SO3, it's more complicated. It's called it's, they're the Wigner D matrices, but I'm, um, I'll just not go into details here. Um, and now the next step is to do a harmonic analysis on these groups, which is basically saying um, we are now interested in functions on the group, uh, sort of square integral functions. Um, but we're interested in functions on the group. And any function on the group can basically be expanded in this way. So it's a, th these are just numbers, but th they are indexed in some uh, sort of with three numbers, with these three numbers, M, N, and L. And these are our irreducible representations. And then I sum over all of these values here. And it can, any function that lives on that group can be expanded in this particular way. And then I can define its inverse as well, which is, you know, if, if you give me the function and I, and I sort of integrate over the group, or in, in this case, for instance, the angles of the group, then um, I can get my eta back. So this is just very similar to um, the things that you would do for an orthonormal basis um, in, in linear algebra. And we, and, and we look at this and we can sort of recognize that this actually like a Fourier transform of a function f, because if you do this for SO2, you know, you know that every function f on a, for an angle phi can be expanded in, with these phase factors. And then we can get our phase, the, the, the coefficients back by basically you know, uh, doing the uh, sort of the inverse Fourier transform, so what's right? The connection between complexity of the function and the dimensions of the constituents? Sorry, Lee? Essentially, not every function can expand any dimension. Just like bending the function. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's important that um, uh, so these could be uh, infinite sequences, 
Uh, but they have to be square integral, which sort of forms a, a Hilbert space. It's very, it's very similar to quantum mechanics, by the way. You know about that. Um, but um, when you get to fast Fourier transforms, right, you want to discretize, and then you want to have band-limited functions, and then you want to sort of be, uh, have, you know, make sure that you have eno enough points on the group so that you can do ex ex the exact Fourier transform by using it. Um, okay, so, uh, so here's the step that we made in order to make these groups then um, turn, turn these groups into probability distributions. So here's where the uncertainty comes into play. And we, oops, and we basically said, uh, okay, so a we need a probability on a group. And how do we do that? Uh, we basically say that the log probability is expanded in these irreducible representations of the group. And if you stare at this a little bit, you immediately recognize the exponential family. Because t here are just the sufficient statistics, and then eta are the parameters that multiply the sufficient statistics, and you sort of put all of this in the exponent, and then you normalize. So it's really just an exponential family where we sort of handpicked our statistics t very carefully here. And therefore, it's also quite easy to compute a gradient of this, because um, at least formally, you can just say, well, I'm interested in learning these eta parameters if I have like lots of data, let's say lots of example transformations, g. Then I can compute the gradient of this by just the difference between the moments, the moments over the data where you sort of take the expectation of your statistic over the data, and you need to compute your moments over the probability model p itself. And then you compare them and then you make them closer to each other by your gradient update. But the main point here is that these, this one is typically you know, the, the showstopper. It's very hard to compute it. But for this particular model, it's, it's not so hard to compute it exactly because the existence of the fast Fourier transform. Because you can express this as basically a sequence of two sort of Fourier transforms. First of all, you take the inverse Fourier transform of eta. So this here is actually the inverse Fourier transform of eta and then you take the exponent, and then you take the Fourier transform back, and you have to normalize, and then you get that expected value. But using fast Fourier transforms, this can actually be done very efficiently. And I think that's the core why this is interesting for computer science. Um, so then for, uh, for the group SO2, if you do this, so if you just study what kind of distribution will come out, if you look at this, um, so in other words, if you just take this expression and you apply it to SO2, well, what will happen is you'll, see, you'll come with what's called the generalized von Mises distribution on the circle. Um, and it's basically, the, you know, if you have just one of these j's, you have the von Mises distribution, but you sort of have a, a number of domini a, 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 a number that you can pick yourself for different frequencies. And then you can play the following game. You can say, well, let's have observations which are sort of in, in some space, you know, say an image space, x and then I rotate x to another image like this. So I have observed x and y. And now I want to infer the probability over the angles, the transformations, that are responsible for mapping this image to this image. Right? And I have a prior. This is, this is my prior over, over group transformations. And this is my likelihood, which is given a transformation. You know, uh, how do I? get from x to y, it's a normal distribution with invariance. And it turns out that these two are always conjugate. So this is actually a conjugate prior for this likelihood. And I can analytically compute the posterior distribution over the phi given x and y. And it turns out, of course, it's an, again a generalized von Mises distribution, but uh, you know, with parameters k and mu changed. And so you can write it up. And so it's interesting, so here, from here to here, you have sort of four explanations in the, in the posterior you know, in going from here to here, because there's four possible rotations which can actually explain this. And it's fuzzy because, uh, because our sort of likelihood model has some noise in it. If you go from a circle to a circle, clearly, you know, any transformation could have sort of done that. And so you have a uniform distribution over rotations. And if you take something more interesting, you get some sort of more a peak at the most likely explanation and sort of smaller peaks at rotations that are um, sort of less likely to have generated that. And then you can do this for SO3, and now it gets much more complicated because these are three-dimensional um, you know, rotations. Um, so you can sort of, okay, so let's take a function on a sphere and sort of uh, map it onto itself. What are 
all, you know, all the possible transformations which could have generated this. Um, and then you get, you know, in alpha, you know, these three angles space, which are sort of identified on each one of the, on each one of the sides, you get this really intricate, complicated distribution over, over these angles. And for this transformation, which is not identity, but a small change, you get this one. So the point is not to impress you with these images, but it's like, you can, you can actually compute this, which is quite amazing. You can actually compute the complete posterior distribution over all the possible transformations which could have generated you know, a rotation from here to here. And this, of course, thanks to this fast Fourier transform. Um, and then we need one little uh, sort of additional thing here, which is that um, you know, coming up with trans, you know, distributions over rotations is one thing, but maybe what we really like is to come up with distributions over spaces that we're more familiar with. Not, not SO3, but let's say I want to have a distribution over the sphere. Let's say I'm a geoscientist and I want to figure out what's the distribution over earthquakes, right? Earthquakes happen on the earth um, and I want to come up with a distribution over earthquakes. And the thing to do is that actually we have developed this harmonic analysis for uh, groups, so we need to sort of identify what is the, what is the group which is <coughs> equivalent to the sphere. And it's not very hard to see what it is. Um, you know, you can sort of say, well, like, let's take the North Pole and map from the North Pole to any other point on the sphere. And you can do this clearly by rotation, but there's many rotations which would actually do that. So in order to get from here to here, you can do, there's many solutions in SO3 which will get you there. And in order to identify the sphere with a group, you really have to have a unique transformation. And uh, what you have to do is you have to sort of mod out these transformations which turn the North Pole into itself. So you just you know, say, I, I'm not interested in these rotations, but up to these rotations, then it's unique. There's a unique transformation from here to here. And it basically, technically, it means you have to sort of do this modeling operation. Um, the the take-home message is that, yes, we have identified a group, um, and uh, we, so we can still do our Fourier and harmonic analysis using fast Fourier transforms on the sphere. So then if you do that, and so here is our sort of distribution over earthquakes, I think it's about 40,000 earthquakes or something like this. Um, and uh, so this is our in log PDF space, it's very important. So you see these small little dots here, but they're really tiny ripples because it's in log space. Um, and uh, so this is a harmonic exponential family distribution. And um, so you see it, it follows, you know, the actual distribution very closely. This is the most complex model that we could find for distribution, for modeling distributions on a sphere. So it's called the Kent mixture model. Um, and uh, it's very hard to train, um, but we tried really hard, um, and with many restarts to sit right using the EM algorithm. And this is then the distribution sort of that we could come up with. It, you know, it does a decent job, but it's clear that, you know, it's much more fuzzy and not as sharp as sort of this model that we have, you know, the exponential family model. You do see a little bit of ringing here. It's very interesting because you're trying to compose this basically by adding these spherical harmonics together. Um, and you, see, you, you do see a little bit of ringing, but again, this is in log space. So it's, it's the, these, ti these tiny little things are highly ex exaggerated. Um, and it looks like it's overfitting on these one earthquakes or these, these few earthquakes here. Uh, but again, these are tiny little um, numbers because it's in log space. So more sort of quantitatively, you know, you can, you can compare this um, uh, Kent mixture model with uh, a harmonic density model. Um, here we have the log likelihood of train data for this one and test data for this one. Um, and here's for the Kent mixture model. So clearly, um, you know, our on, on test we are orders of magnitude, you know, in likelihood higher than the Kent mixture model. And also if you think about, you know, the, um, the time it takes uh, for to train our model, so thanks to our fast Fourier transform, we can train very quickly because we are done training. We fit 22,000 parameters, of course, you know, regularizing appropriately um, around this time. And this is one iteration basically of the mixture model um, or sort of, sorry, it, 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 it's sort of equivalent to training a model with, you know, a few parameters for the Kent mixture model. Um, so it's more, it's more com you know, computationally demanding to train it and it will not get you the same uh, test likelihood. And this is the best you know, model around. 
in, uh, on for modeling densities on spheres. Um, <coughs> so I'm sort of towards the end of sort of the talk where I could, you know, I'll, I'll wrap up here and then uh, if time allows, I have a little bit of extra things I could add in um, after maybe um, a little lighter if time allows. Um, so the so the outlook is that you know I've been looking at these variational um, autoencoders as a way to combine discriminative and generative models together, and sort of we can still save you know what we like most about modeling is injecting uh, our prior knowledge or expert knowledge, and also we can exploit unlabeled data in the case we have many more uh, features than we have data points. Um, <coughs> And we can generate probabilities uh, to represent uncertainty uh, on all of the you know, labels and input spaces, and that's often important for sort of decision making. Um, and we have algorithms that can train these models very efficiently. And then related sort of to the space of representations that you will train that come out of these models, uh, we were thinking about, okay, what does it mean to disentangle a representation? And we decided that group theory and irreducible representations form a very nice uh, sort of mathematical framework to study those. Um, we have defined flexible densities on manifolds and transformations using these harmonic densities. Um, for this, the reason why this is successful is that there exists this harmonic analysis tool um, that is very efficient based on these fast Fourier transforms. Um, and then uh, the outlook is that we actually use these fast Fourier transform also to uh, learn neural networks, but that not only sort of do convolutions, but also uh, sort of like, like translations, but also do all sorts of other uh, symmetry transformations on the data. So um, I'm not sure, I should, should I stop here? Well, we take questions and if you have more time yeah. questions. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, yeah. Okay, so I'll stop here now for questions. So the idea, the ideal case would be that you could learn the symmetry group. Um, although we haven't, we've tried it, but we haven't gotten that far with it. So uh, you can think of sort of a hidden representation, like again, more like the generative model with Z going to X. You can think of a hidden representation. Um, and then you can sort of apply symmetries, you know, to these. Uh, to these inputs, like a rotation over certain angles, and you could even you know, try to parameterize this more generally, um, and then try to learn sort of irreducible representations. It's quite hard to do it, um, but this is sort of our goal. We've, we've tried a little bit, and we've uh, submitted that to iClear, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard. Um, but yeah, so, so that's for top down. Um, for bottom up, it's maybe easier, so for these neural network that we were talking about yesterday. Actually, you mentioned it yourself. This, I think this is an interesting match. Um, so uh, in this case, you could just look at you know, the symmetries, you know, maybe affine symmetries that are relevant for images um, and uh, sort of filter the input through this much larger group of symmetries, not just translations, but all sorts of other symmetries, and then have these pooling operations which try to to impose invariance, local invariance on, on all of these symmetries. So it's very much in line with what you said yesterday. Um, and uh, again, that idea may not be revolutionary, but the really important thing is that these fast Fourier transforms can be defined. And so that will make this tick because you, know, you can now actually do these convolutions with fast Fourier transforms and then you can actually make it work. Mm -hmm. And essentially you have an autoencoder, uh, autoencoder, uh, autoencoder, 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 aut
Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I should have said that. Information bottleneck, yeah. <laughs> so the information bottleneck is here, right? Yeah. yeah. And you have one deterministic configuration x to z, and another deterministic configuration x to x. Yeah. So without, but, but in that case, you will not have these stochastic units then, is the idea. Right. The, um, that's what I'm trying to understand. What is the difference or the advantage of. Right. So it's a bit, it's a bit similar to saying. The strange thing is that we then. Um, well, and, and um, so one of the things is you don't get probabilities and you're not representing uncertainty that way. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is exactly the same discussion that you would have by saying, okay, why do I even train a probabilistic model in the first place? Why do I need probability distribution if I just you know, require just compression? Right? And yeah. then I can, I can clearly imagine you will not meet these probabilities. I'm just interested in these hidden units. And I don't think this will then add very much. But here you can actually generate from your model very easily. Like you actually, if you just disconnect this bit, you actually have a generative model. Where for an autoencoder, it's much harder, right? I mean, it's like you have to, you have, to have your input in order to generate your output. Um, and you don't have a distribution on your, on your hidden units. But if you talk to Jan LeCun, probably, he will say, you don't need that, right? You know. <laughs> It's all fine doing everything deterministically. And for certain applications, it is. But for others, I would argue it isn't. And this is exactly like when do you need uncertainty? And I think you need uncertainty, for instance, when you're doing planning or reinforcement learning, which is the case where you would need it. But they're very related. I mean, I could turn these perhaps into yeah, deterministic nodes and come up with an ordinary button encoder. Okay, well that's interesting. Um, you, you, you're thinking about some limit, um, some limit case where it will turn in, that into it. Um, yeah, I I would think so, but I would ha I, I can't claim it now because I don't see exactly because you need a KL between things. And if you turn things into delta peaks, a KL is not as useful anymore. So you maybe have to switch to another objective rather than the KL. Um, so yeah, have to think about it a bit more. No, I, th I think it's probably better to, uh, to, to stop here. <laughs>